Monday mornings with Matt and Kevin. Topics that come up around the dinner table will be given the truth treatment with no punches held and no falsehood left standing. These two will debate real life issues from a Catholic perspective every Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern. And we are back for another Monday morning with Matt and Kevin. I'm Kevin, he's Matt. And today we're going to be talking about several pretty cool topics. Um, one of them being the saint of the day who is, well, she's pretty cool. I don't know if cool is a word, but she's, no, she's pretty cool. St. Teresa, the little flower. Um, if you're in heaven, you're officially cool. Um, we're also going to be talking a bit about the Nord Stream pipeline, but just just a little bit, a bit about what's going on with the crazy, wacky Bergoglian sect, also known as the Novus Ordo, also known, unfortunately, as the Catholic Church. But we're going to start off the show today with a topic. Ladies, ladies, close your ears. You're not going to want to listen to this, probably this entire segment, because, well, we're going to talk about sports. But before we get going, everything that we talk, that we talk about today, we are not experts. Um, if you have any issues or any problems with um yeah religion with theology talk to a priest if you have any issues with science or medicine which i don't think we're going to talk about today but you know you never know don't talk to us go talk to your doctor if you have any issues about politics well yeah i don't know find a bum on the street and uh, ask his opinion otherwise we're just here to have a good time to have a conversation to have a chat and we are glad that you are here with us so matt what's up how you doing and um what's going on in the sports world yeah, Kevin, I am. So I'm a lifelong Yankee fan, right? So oh, lifelong. I didn't have a choice. I didn't have a choice. I grew up with it. I was born. You People say you're born a Yankee fan. I was born a Yankee fan. My grandparents came over from Italy, went to New York area here in the, in the U.S. and immediately dove right into the baseball world. And so what I wanted to kind of just talk about today was the very controversial home run record that is kind of, you know, filling the, the baseball world today. So um, the Yankees have a player named Aaron Judge, popular name in the sports sports world, a phenom really in, in the Yankee realm. And as of this recording, there is a game uh, still to be played. So hopefully that doesn't change. Maybe it, I do hope it changes. But either way, uh, as of this recording, Aaron Judge currently has 61 home runs on the season. And the problem with that is that there are only three other players in the 122 seasons of baseball that have been played. Yes, I sadly know that. I hope I'm not wrong now that I say that so confidently. Um, there are only three other players that have hit more home runs in a single season than the 61 that Aaron Judge currently has of today. And those names are Barry Bonds, Mark McGuire, and Sammy Sosa. Now, the problem with these guys, and, and, and I know you have some strong opinions about this, Kevin, and you and I are, are, are going to disagree a bit, um, but we'll, we'll see how you know this kind of pans out. Those three players have been accused and or admitted of taking performance-enhancing drugs. Cheetahs. Steroids. Steroids. <laughs> yeah, right. Steroids. So, the, so Bonds hit 73 home runs in 2001, which broke the record of McGuire set in uh, 1998 when he hit 70 and Mark McGuire. So that stood there and Sammy Sosa's numbers were, uh, he hit 66 in 98 as well. So those three players, they shattered the record of, of Roger Maris in his 61 home runs in 1961. Now the, the, the thing is when judge hit his home run the other day, it was uh, earlier in the week, there were people who were saying, you know what, if he hits 62, which there are a few games left of the season, then he would now be the rightful, single season home run champion with 62 because those numbers by Maguire, Sosa, Bonds uh, are <laughs> invalid. Tainted. So, so tainted. So I take the opinion of, I don't know if you kind of want to share your thoughts first, Kevin, or if you want me to just take the opinion that who's, who's the real home run king here? Would it be, would it be the 62 with Aaron Judge or does Bonds stand atop with 73? Give me your take. Well, and, and I think that, again, people are probably wondering, why on earth are these guys who tend to talk about culture and theology, why are they talking about sports? And, well, first of all, we're just both sports fans. I, I've been a baseball guy since I was two. And mm. and so it's been Not a big first. deal for me. I, I remember 98. I imagine you do, too. We're the same age. Yes. Like 98 was just absolutely insane. The most exciting yes. season of baseball I've ever witnessed um, with the chase, the home run chase between Sosa and McGuire. Until, of course, fairly soon after, a few years after you learned that they had been cheating, 
and had even Sammy Sosa was even caught with a corked bat a few yes. weeks later while playing with the Cubs. So he was he was a cheater. He was proven to be a cheater. He cheated, you know, trying to to use bats that were not legal in the game of baseball. And he was absolutely, admittedly, a cheater in terms of putting in something into his body that gave him an unfair advantage. This is the same with Mark McGuire. It's the same with Barry Bonds. Now, what we're pretty much saying is these guys who eventually got the record, quote unquote, got the record, they had an advantage that players for the first, what, 98 years of baseball did not have. And now, if you watch the first 30, 40 years of baseball, these guys were swinging like they were cutting the heads off of sunflowers. I mean, these guys were, they had the strangest swings. They, they, they don't look the same. The game of baseball didn't look the same, really. And Roger Maris, who I believe, what did he, when did he, he hit it in the late 60s? I think, I think you, did you say 61. He, 61, 60, 61. 61 even. Wow. So, so way back in 61. Mm. 61 and, years ago, ironically. And that's, that's pretty incredible. And, and that, that, and again, <clears> the, <throat> the game looked so much different back then. Pitchers weren't pitching as fast, et cetera. And, and a lot of people right. kind of act like, hey, this is a good thing. It was exciting, et cetera. I, I think absolutely not. I think it's disgraceful. I think it's a disgrace to sports and society that we even allowed these records to stand when these players admittedly or were provenly cheaters. Well, how, can we, how can we allow that? How can we allow a sport that, that I love that has been a, a major part of American history in a way in the cultural side – and to let these cheaters come in and take these records from from men like Hank Aaron and from Roger Maris, I, I think it's a disgrace. So here's my my response to that. And those three names stand out, you know, Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa, Barry Bonds, because they broke records, right? Those those three are are are, and they're not in the Hall of Fame for this very reason, um, you know, by by the voters, but. Um, from what we know, from what we've gathered, from the information that we've pulled in, you've got players like Jose Canseco, for example, who has said, you know, 95% of players were on steroids. There were um, players who were guilty of steroids. I can think of one, Jeremy Giambi, his name was. Nobody knows who that guy is. He was found guilty of performance enhancing drugs. Do. <laughs> oh, you do know him. Yeah, right. Well, if, you, if, you're, if you're really engrossed in the sport, yeah, you know these guys. The guy hit nothing so in my mind at first there's got to be a level of talent here because if all sure. of these guys of were on steroids which the 90s was you know the steroid era of baseball it, it was the thing to do um and they all admitted it um nobody came close to these numbers so in my mind first there's there is still a talent that players no matter how much they're injecting themselves they're they're, they're not performing at that level um second of all if we if we balance it out here if all, you've got these guys hitting these these home runs, but the pitchers too, Roger Clemens was a, was a massive name in in this controversy uh, in this in this conversation uh, as being guilty of steroids. And so, to me, if the hitter is on steroids, the pitcher is on steroids, we've got an evil we've got a level playing field again. And so, the way I see it is, if we start by putting asterisks next to Bonds, next to McGuire, next to Sosa. Where does it stop? Do, are the Yankees, Kevin? You'd, you'd like this, but are the Yankees' titles of of the world now invalid because uh, Roger Clemens was steroids? So do we take no? The, I mean, you, I mean, you don't take the do team. You, you can't take the teams. It. You can't but take the teams' cheated. records. But they cheated, right? But yeah. they now, cheated. They well, on, he cheated. The on steroids. No, right? you can take. So you can take Clemens. You can take Clemens' records. You can take Clemens' what three hundred wins or whatever he had, and say no, that that doesn't. That is, I would say, you don't put an asterisk on it. I say, hey, you get caught cheating. You got perf doing things that you're not allowed to do. You should not have any records. They're gone. I mean, I mean look what happened to the to the White Sox, you know, the, or the Black Sox. You know, they they, okay, they were bet they were betting on games and betting against yes. themselves. So that's a different issue. But you know, if you did something against the integrity of the game, you were done. You were gone. You you no longer existed in the in the game of baseball. And I think that's the way it should be. Because if you don't do that, then you allow cheating and you allow this gross side of sports to exist and look what's happened i mean, so, I mean the 90s existed because they let it so do you think though do you think though that cheating was exclusive to the 90s and that's another point that i kind of get caught up on players in the past they've gotten caught greg nettles was a yankee third baseman in the 70s he got caught corking his bat so they and and, and i'm sure this isn't new so that's another thing that i try to keep in mind of is players were always looking for an advantage Right. I, I don't think that's new in the sport. You know, I don't think that suddenly came to be in the in the nineties. I think throughout history, 
um, players were looking to get ahead. You want to be better um, for yourself, for your team, for your finances, right? If you perform well, you're going to get a, a nice payday. Um, but I, I just see it as, and, and, and you kind of hinted on it, but there is an integrity, of course. But if somebody like Barry Bonds' home runs are invalid, if Roger Clemens' wins are invalid, those numbers affected the team, right? How many how many games did San Francisco maybe win because of Bonds' home runs? How many okay. how many how many how many wins from the Yankees? Or I'm just using Roger Clemens exclusively, but it's, it was throughout baseball. Um, they all cheated for the most part, but it's the ones that were really really good. It's the it's the greatest players of that era who had fingers pointed at them because they were good. There are players who are on steroids who are absolutely nobodies who didn't do well. Um, who you don't really even know. So there's still, in my mind, there's a level of talent here. These guys, steroids or not, they're in a class of their own. Barry Bonds, when he was a thin little guy, I don't know if I, you, you look up pictures, right? He was Kevin? a great player. Yeah. He was a thin, thin, thin guy. And he peaked at 40 or so, which is unheard of in baseball, right? He got bigger. His neck got huge. Like, he got bigger. Obviously, he's he's doing something here. His numbers were incredible still. His, he didn't strike out, which nowadays everybody strikes out all the time. His on-base percentage was, uh, you know, through the roof. He, he got on base at a, at a record rate. Um, these guys are in a league of their own, steroids or not. And the competition was on. I mean, I, it's very difficult to me. Um, once you start putting asterisks, and I see your point, but once you start putting asterisks, um, how can you then how can you say that the Yankees wins were valid if these guys were cheap? I mean, where, when do you stop? When do you when do you say, you know what? All right. It's valid here, but it wasn't valid there. Where's yeah, the but line? it's it's with, one of those with, things with that you don't know. You can assume that everyone was cheating, but some guys were proven to have cheated. I mean, even even under I think even in, in Congress. Right. Didn't they be, get some of these guys got brought in Congress and were proven to have cheated. Now, you know, if, if I don't think you can attribute it to the team because, yeah, I, it does get complicated. But I think you can just cut it there and just say, no, the team records, et cetera. That doesn't matter. You know, you had, you had a lot of players playing, et cetera. The players that were proven to have cheated. How on earth do we just allow that? How, how do we just say? You know, for, for all this time, you know, for these years where they're breaking these records and they, they, hmm. they we know for certain that they cheated and we're just OK with it. We're just we're just going to say, yeah, Roger Maris. We're going to say again, you know, th these guys, Hank Aaron, who held the the, the all time um, as a professional player, the home run record. Right. You know, and a guy right. who 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 got that through years and years and years of being a really good player back before it, I think before any steroids even existed and to have that blemished. Because a guy went and juiced himself with with you know whatever whatever he's put into his body, I think that's I again I think it ruins the sport and I, and I see it not in, just in baseball I, I see it over here in soccer as well and I, I it becomes mm. the sports become like a machine like, like these players become these these giant dudes who are just pumped full of they don't look natural they don't look like men and if you look back in the 1980s and you watch these games they, they looked like normal guys who would go and have a beer and a cigarette after the game and when they played they played like men and you watch the games right now they play like robots and i hate it i hate it and it, it's just it's an example of what the world has become the world does not yeah. become hey we do this for the joy of the game we do it because we love it we do it because we want to the fans to enjoy the pure pleasure of sport no they just want to do anything they can to be the best, even if it means cheating. And I'm not okay with that. Yeah, I, I was looking. Um, it was a clip from the 1950s. Willie Mays, a you know uh, Hall of Fame uh, outfielder for the um, for the Giants. Uh, before the game started, he was walking around um, the outside of the stadium, greeting fans and signing autographs for fans and mingling with the players. And kind of like you said, there there was that different dynamic back then. Now, today, I mean, um, I haven't been to a, a game in, in a few years, but it is impossible. You cannot. These guys are, are like, you know, VIPs. They're like, you have as much of a chance as, as getting to, you know, meet a, a, a president or, or, a, or a monarch or a prime minister or what have you. You can't get to these guys. It is impossible. Maybe they, they do come out and they greet fans a little bit, but there's security, there's gates, there's barriers. I, I did it. I, I tried. And. It's almost impossible um, because, yeah, as you said, they 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 have played for this this new um, the, these contracts. They're, they're getting money that is unheard of. I mean, you've got guys playing for 400, 500 million dollars to play this game. Um, but just a point to bring back too. I mean, I, it makes me wonder how many guys are playing 
They just haven't gotten caught. Uh, there's a guy in the Padres, Fernando Tatis Jr. He was just found guilty, suspended for a year, performance-enhancing drugs. These guys know how to cycle it out. Alex Rodriguez, when he, um, another Yankee, Texas Ranger, third baseman, shortstop, um, he ended up getting caught. But in an interview, he said, my doctors, my my team, they knew exactly what to do and how to do it to to for me to cheat and for me to pass all tests to come out clear. Um, yeah, but but some of these guys. Let this. me give you let me give you an example. I'm I'm a Colorado yeah. Rockies fan, and so maybe you know Oof. the name Todd, Todd Helton. Yeah, I know. Not, of not course, but Todd Helton, excellent hitter. Of course, back back in the day, he was a first baseman for the Rockies, and he he never. I mean, the guy looked like he drank Coors Light on the weekend, <laughs> right? and and he always did. But he was a great player yeah. and a great hitter, one of the best pure yeah. hitters yes. in the 90s and 2000s. A really good hitter should be a Hall of Famer. And you know what? He probably won't be a Hall of Famer. And you want to know why? Because every one of these guys who even got cut now, now some of these guys aren't going into the Hall of Fame, like Barry Bonds or Sammy Sosa, but but many of them yeah. have been. I mean, Alex Rodriguez probably will be. I mean, many of these guys who probably did cheat and did become these gigantic, monstrous, you know, <laughs> physical men. They are they they even outperformed Todd Helton's numbers. And and that's that's a shame. And not even just that. And I don't know for certain that Todd Helton didn't do didn't do drugs, but he doesn't look like a guy who did. I'm sorry. Yeah, he, he was right, a pure right. hitter. Like Tony Gwynn was Tony a bit Gwynn. before he was a bit before Todd Helton. There's no way that guy did did performance enhancing drugs. He was just an incredible hitter. He had an incredible talent. And his records, Todd Helton's records, the players that didn't cheat. They are all blemished by the fact of these guys who did, and the guys who got caught. That does matter, even if everyone else was cheating. If you got caught, there must have been a reason for it. You, either you're stupid or you cheated more. And uh, yeah, yeah. I, um, Tony Gwynn was one of the greatest hitters I have ever seen. I mean, you, you won't find a guy like that in baseball anymore. These he him. Um, I would actually say that Ichiro was probably the last of that kind. Where it was almost as if. They could put the bat on the ball when they wanted, how they wanted, where they wanted, and, and literally poke that ball into any part of the field. That they, they're just incredible hitters. But I think one final point to make, and I'm curious your thoughts on this, you know, taking these performance-enhancing drugs, right, it makes you, the most part is they, they say it helps you from, or prevents you from breaking down. You know, you, you, you have an endurance that, that's higher. But is there any evidence that actually shows that, you have, I don't know, better eye-hand coordination. Are you a better hitter? And I know, yeah, you're stronger, but how much farther are you hitting the ball out than you would have hit it out? So I don't really know how to equate these drugs with the actual skill of hitting the ball, which is the hardest thing to do in sports, they say. You know, there's nothing harder in all sports to do than hit, hit a ball with a, a bat. Um, how much of a better hitter does it make you? And I don't know if that's been answered. Well, I think, I think as you said, you have to be, already be a great hitter and then add on the steroids to become the greatest of all time type of hitter. And I think that's totally true. McGuire, mm. Sosa, Canseco, Bonds, they were all already great hitters. And that's unquestionable. They were. And then they all ballooned up to totally unnatural sizes and started jacking the ball out like crazy. That that just shows me that, yeah, you do have to be, no question you have to be already talented. But it did, I think, unquestionably that the steroids did help these great players to become all timers in terms of setting records. And I, I think, again, it's it's just... That's cheap. I, I I really hate it, and and I think that it's a shame that that it was allowed to happen, and, and that and, and here's something else that you see. This is a really interesting effect from it. So this really started. It really boomed in 1998 again with this the chase of Sosa and McGuire, mm -hmm. which I fully admit was the most exciting season of baseball I've ever witnessed in my life, except for okay, maybe when the Rockies went to the World Series in 2007. When, but when anyway, was that? Oh, 2007. 2007. Don't even they remember. lost. They lost to Boston, unfortunately, but it, uh, an amazing. Uh. But anyway. And so this, why, is what, this is what's happened. And so from, from, from 1998, the MLB decided we're losing our fans because people are getting bored with baseball. So we need to make home runs possible. So the league turned their eyes and said, oh, la, 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 steroids until, right, well, until eventually they decided, no, we are going to have to do something about this because other outside forces are complaining. Now, what happened is through the last, oh, what is it now, 20 years, the game became about, you know, strikeouts and home runs. And this is the crazy thing. They had to outlaw the shift. Now, I don't know anyone here is a major ba baseball fan, but the shift pretty much allows the players, the defensive players on the infield to, to go all the way to one side of the field, which means one side of the field is empty. So give me, I'll give you an example. I'm a left-handed hitter. 
if I'm coming up to bat left-handed, everyone on the infield would all move to the right side of the infield because they're assuming that I'm going to pull the ball to the right because that's how everyone hits now. Now, you would think what people could do, it, like Tony Gwynn, Todd Helton, guys who actually could hit, if someone moved a shift, you would just hit the ball to the left exact, side of the freaking right. infield. Exactly. I mean, exactly. And, and they exactly. can't do it because, <laughs> it, because the entire game has been ruined, ruined, ruined by these cheaters. And so they had to illegalize. They had to make it illegal to do the shift because the players have formed such bad habits because of the stupid home run addiction and it's, it's ruined the game of baseball. They shifted on Ted Williams, though. And Ted Williams played in what? 19? Oh, man. Well, Maybe he got like 4,000 hits. So, obviously, he did more. <laughs> he did. He did. I think, yeah, I think there is evidence. Because I thought myself, this is about when I was growing up. Um, when I played baseball. But there was the normal defensive alignment. And then they called it the double play depth. and I, Which kind of set up um, to get two out. For those who don't know, you you you. you are able to get two outs and kind of like one play. Um, that our, was our really British the only fans, our British our British listeners. They must be like totally what? Out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was the really only way to align yourselves, right? So when they started doing this stuff, I remember um, the Yankees had a guy, Jason Giambi, early two thousands, and they, he was the real Yankee that I first remember, anyway. Of these crazy shifts, like you said, that they would move the entire defense all to one side in anticipation that he's going to hit the ball there. So you're increasing your odds of getting it out. And he would never hit it the other way. Um, and the reason, as you said, was because they, they want the home run. He's playing for the home run. He's going to hit the home run. And he doesn't care that he's not. He would rather hit into the shift than hit against it uh, because he's not trying. He, he wants to hit the ball over the fence. That's what fans are going to see. And, and, I, I, and, and I want to wrap this up. I want to wrap this up yeah, with a cultural. Yeah. I, I want to yeah. give an example of how this compares to culture. Because sure. this, is, this is what happens in the world. When everyone is trying to hit a home run, and the world tells you, and Disney tells you, and, and your schools tell you, and everyone says, you've got to hit a home run. You've got to go do, follow your dreams, do the thing you want to do. You, know, you, 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 you. In, in terms of you're just swinging as hard as you can. That is not reality. That is not life. That is not the game we play. And it's not even the game, you know, we're actually even in a team in terms of society, right? And, and, and mm. family, and friends, and parishes. And, and our goal is to, yeah, get on base. Our goal is to have a good at bat. Our goal is to to take the right pitches. It's not just to swing as hard as we possibly can and hope that we get a moment of glory or we strike out. That's not reality. That's not how life actually mm. works. And it's a microcosm of the issue in society where a normal life, a, a, a simple life, a normal job, a, a something that seems small, it's enough and it's good and it's beautiful and it's a perfect segue for our St. Teresa segment. But that's going to come up a little bit later. But the simple life, and so St. Teresa and baseball in one conversation, that gets me Who would have thought? points on the day. <laughs> anyway, um, do you have any last thoughts on it? No, I no, you, you, you covered it well. And I mean, um, I, I like your point there. Where it, the game has become very individualized, right? Totally. You know, you don't play as a team. You know, your mindset of, I, let me get on base to help my team. Let me poke a single to help my team. Let me steal base to help my team. It's become, I need to hit this ball 500 feet because my contract next year needs to be $40 million. 100%. 100%. I totally, yep. I totally agree. And, and you see, again, it all it all starts with cheating and, and thinking that if I if I can break the rules, then I'll be just this much better. No anyway, money. that was our that was probably the one baseball uh, segment we're ever going to have. Um, maybe next <laughs> week we'll talk a little bit about soccer, um, football for you. I don't know players. anything. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk about their, how much they cheat as well um, because that's also a big issue for me. And how they <clears> celebrate, too. The celebrations. Anyway, that we'll save that for another time. Um, up next, we're going to talk about, again, the Nord Stream pipeline as well as well, a couple other topics. I think St. Teresa may just pop into the conversation since today is St. Teresa's feast day. And she is one of our all-time favorite saints, one of the greatest saints of all time. And so we will talk about that up next after this quick break. Hey, guys. What if having your finances in order actually could make you a better Catholic? What if it allowed you to give more, to be more generous, to tithe on a regular basis, to not be stressed about money in your marriage? At Dan Kramer Inc., we teach people how to organize and structure their finances to recover cost, to lower their risk, and to actually have a plan 
that they're comfortable with to win this game of finances. And it's not just to have a big pile of money, but to allow you to actually do the things that you want to do. Many of my clients are Catholics and they find that they can focus on what's actually important, like their faith and their family and their fitness and not have to worry so much about the finances. I, I hope this helps you and I hope if you have any questions at all, reach out to Dan at Dan Kramer Inc. or Ben and we'd love to have a conversation with you. Thank you. Make the world Catholic again. And we are back and we hope you appreciated that first segment and for the few people who stuck with us who are, well, you must be baseball fans or, or you're very patient. So we appreciate that. Thanks for sticking with us. And we're going to talk about, well, we got to start talking about Matt, about the, the Nord Stream pipeline. And I, I mean, a lot, this is all conjecture. We don't really know what happened here. We really don't. Nobody knows. It's all up in the air, but I'm just going to, I'm going to throw it to you. I'm going to let you get in trouble with YouTube and the um, <laughs> social police. Um, what do you think happened with the Nord Stream pipeline? So, honestly, it's, it's hard for me to say. Um, and the reason I say that is because my, I guess you can call it ability or my, my inclination to trust what I see on the news is like next to nothing. I fake news is, is paramount here. So what I do know and what we have seen is that this pipeline that you know pumps gas from russia to to europe um had a leak in it um and it leaked incredible amounts into the ocean and then the the, the problem was is who was the the culprit here who did this and i think immediately the finger pointing started to you know immediately surface uh no pun intended um so from <laughs> from what i have seen and, and and again this just makes me think like wow the narrative is, is strong for either depending on which side i guess you could say you're on um when i was doing some research earlier on um the us was kind of quick to say russia did this this was russia russia intentionally you know did this assault on their own pipeline here to to cause problems to to make further you know chaos in the world to to paint russia as the bad guy right when We're when fighting... russia could literally just turn it off and they had it was turned off <laughs> right. so, so hey right. hey guys hey i'm russia and um hey i already turned off the pipeline so let's go blow it up because because right. because it's cool right. uh, so ugh. so there's there's the other side of it is did the us have involvement with this in order to uh maybe shift or or, or change the narrative on the russia ukraine conflict because now you know the us pumps it's it's incredible to me you see these headlines every few days 14 billion sent to ukraine uh, it, it's all the time it's become like a weekly allowance i think I, somebody said that on twitter and it's kind of stuck with me um they want that american support for for ukraine for whatever political purposes that they they are eyeing so when you, if they were to sabotage this pipeline and to you know now europe is going to suffer right europe is depending on this i don't know what you're experiencing firsthand over there kevin but um there's a lot of you know worry and fear now like we we need this for the winter it's october it's going to be getting cold can we can we get through this and so in order to win that support for uh for for the U ukrainian conflict and to kind of reel in all of europe it's to make russia look like the bad guy right and, and, so and who's gonna it, who's gonna sell who's gonna sell Russia or who's gonna sell europe energy and oil if they're not getting it from nobody Russia. nobody or the u.s nobody. it's going to be the u.s right. or it's going to be, i guess maybe the middle east right but if it's not coming from russia then who's going to be the savior who's going to come in and oh well i guess and, and you know what else is going to happen the euro the euro is going to crash probably i mean the banks are already crashing even as we speak here in europe deutsche bank is is like is, is almost at bankruptcy i mean it's really really disastrous and you know who benefits from this America benefits from it because the of dollar, course. the dollar gains. I mean, come on. I mean, this is this is really, really common sense. Who benefits from blowing up the pipeline? <laughs> right. Russia. Russia has the button on, off, click, click, on, off. Whatever oh, they well, want. Let's go blow it up because because um, why? Why, and he, why on earth would they blow uh, it up? Yeah, it actually says. Um, I pulled up. Um, I was looking at this the other day, and I pulled it up here. Um, it was it's the New York Times, um, and it says uh. A spokesman for Russian President Vladimir Putin dismissed the allegations of Russia's involvement as, quote, stupid, and rather pointed at, I love, you know, he's right, based. I love, and it says here, they Russia pointed fingers at the United States. So, I mean, 
as you said, what in the world would Russia gain from this? Because if they if they did do it on purpose, if they blew it up, right, they're going to continue to make themselves look like the bad guy. They're trying. Not, I don't know how much they want to do that. I think they want a favorable opinion in the world to, to some extent. I don't know, but um, that would make no sense here. It would only make sense to me if the U.S. or its allies had some involvement to shift the narrative to kind of, you know, and that's more than anything is, is you, you win a lot of these wars with mind games. You win a lot of these wars with what sort of propaganda you're putting out there. So if we well, can, hey, if the U S can Biden, benefit, they're going to try to do it. Biden said, he said, Hey, it, uh, this was, this was before the war officially started. I think he's like, Hey, if, mm. if Russia invades Ukraine, the Nord Stream pipeline's not even going to exist. Now that's, that's a paraphrase. Right. That's, what, that's what he said. So he, he, right. he said months ago, Hey, if you invade Ukraine, we're going to blow up Nord Stream. And now it's like, Oh my goodness, right. the U S would never blow up Nord Stream. It's like, this is such a joke. I, I am not a Russian fan. I'm not, I'm not saying Putin is this great sure. guy. I, sure. I think Russia, like Putin, I, I, I sent, I sent Matt, uh, a text the other day with a with a transcript of Putin's speech from last week, and and I think Putin absolutely nailed, nailed it. the issues nailed it. with the Western it. society. Now, don't get me wrong, Putin and Russia have plenty of their own issues. They are not perfect at all. I'm not saying at all they're the good guys. Now, this but this comes down to the same issue with Nazis. It's like, hey, you know what? You can say communism is bad. And you can say Nazism is bad. They're not mutually exclusive. Russia can yeah. be bad and America can be bad. Why is this so hard to understand? I mean, just because Putin is a dictator trying to take over Ukraine or whatever he's trying to do doesn't mean the U.S. has all of these perfect intentions of going and saving the world. Do you think U.S., do you think Biden gives half a darn about Ukraine? Of course no. they don't. Come on. <laughs> no, no. Wake up. No, I mean. We need to. What we need to do, Kevin, is we need to just consecrate Russia. I mean, <laughs> that <worked>. we did <laughs> it. <laughs> <Right. Didn't> we... <laughs> Thanks for that, Bergoglio. Did, thank, thank you. Uh, Speaking uh, of Bergoglio, you know, his so, holiness. So, I mean, so, so, so as long as, as long as you know, okay, his his consecrations don't work. Well, I mean, he's not the Pope, and he's he's a pagan and, and an atheist. So, I mean, of course, his consecrations to our leader aren't going to help. Not going to work. So, so what's going on? Exactly. You kind of brought up something to my attention. I've I've been off Twitter, which has been beautiful. I I feel like a sure, new man. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I, I miss a lot of these crazy things that are going on. So what's going on with, with the synod of synodality art? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the official, and th this is what's mind boggling here is the official Vatican synod page is releasing these images that even, you know, moderate Novus Ordo attendees are kind of cringing over a little bit. And some of these images, you can certainly find them on Twitter go to the uh, Vatican Synod page. I don't advise you to do so, but th they are there. And they depict all of these certain illustrations of um, these, these, these groups uh, of, say, Muslims, non-Catholics, uh, but, you know, quote-unquote Christian, uh, homosexuals, LGBTQ. It's written directly on these these images so it's not like you know people are interpreting them a certain way it actually says lgbtq inclusion and whatnot on these things um there's a picture of a woman who's dressed in vestments like she's a woman priest um and they continue to to to, to you know push this listening church sort of monologue here but this is a catholic and, church right this is catholic right this is not oh this is oh this is this no, is, no, this no. Is... This, this is this is the mystical body of Christ, Great. and so what? There was a quote here, and it, and I can't remember this exactly, but it was um, on this on the one of the images, and it said something along the lines of, again, I'm just paraphrasing because I'm going off memory, but it, it was something like, um, "We together form the church, and the church needs to listen to us," and that was it. And it made me think, and I read that, and it made me think, these people have such a poor understanding of what the church is it's not a, it's not a mere collection of believers it's not a mere group or an organization or a club of you know people that that you know have different beliefs but we all believe in god or we all believe in you know and and, and even certain catholic teachings um it's not that at all and 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 it made me think that like we've really and i've touched upon this with you even in, in the interview that you and i did together a while ago now but it's a horizontal church with these people. There's no hierarchy. The Pope, the bishops, the clergymen, they're all basically our equals here. We're all on a level playing field and they need to listen to us. Um, and I think, you know, well, the, and this goes back, this goes back just... to, to Vatican II. Uh -huh. 
Sorry, it goes back to Vatican yeah. II, where they are trying to. One of their primary statements was, "Hey, we want to the, 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 to change with the world." I mean, I mean that that's so right. contrary to what the Catholic Church should be. The Catholic Church should should be always stationary and always the same and always you know one holy Catholic and apostolic. It should not say, "Hmm, well." <laughs> oh man, the lesbians and gays don't like us, so they I guess happy. we better include them. Are you kidding me? Hey, you know these sinners. Oh, these sinners are upset that the Catholic Church says they're sinners. So I guess we better say they're not sinners. This is and a path just, to hell, people. Wake uh, up. Yeah, yeah. And the, and the reason is, and I was talking about this with somebody this morning actually, um, and I made a tweet about it because it tends to happen sometimes if I'm talking to somebody about something, and I'm like, that'd make a great tweet, and then so they kind of intertwine. Um, sometimes, but the church exists. I mean, I don't know how this is very clear for the salvation of souls. That is the point. So if the church condemns something, if the church is hard on something, if the church speaks out against something, it is for your good. It's not to to kind of, you know, everything the church does or, or used to do rather um, was to sanctify me. So if the church teaches something and I disagree, like I need to change because the church is my is my ship to salvation. If I cling to to the church, she leads me to heaven. You can't have this contrary belief where there's like this friction back and forth between the church and the people. That's absurd. Uh, you you follow what the church instructs because she wants me to go to heaven and she knows the best way, like a good mother would. She's gonna she knows what's good for me. She teaches it to me, and I cling to her and I follow it because this is the way that I am saved. You can't have yeah, this, this, this right. And she, and the church, church, of course, the church is divinely inspired. The church is led by the Holy right. Ghost, by God. And, and look what happens when you're not led by God, by the Holy Ghost. You end up turning into the Protestants. And what it happens when you're a Protestant, right. and you end up leading most of the moral corruption in the world. Okay, the Protestants and the Jews, but you know these groups as religions. You know why? Because eventually you get to choose your own morality. You get to choose what's right and wrong. You get to say, well, no. I, at this point, I think it's fine. You know, uh, is abortion okay? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, why not? You know, and, and right. if you don't have an authority, a, a true authority, an authority that's not just man-made, because man-made authorities will always crumble, <clears throat> always, and they will always change. Again, look at the Lutherans. Look at you, any other religion. The Catholic Church is absolutely certain to never fail and never teach error because it comes from god and is led and inspired by the holy ghost and we have to believe that if you don't believe that go join the lutherans for goodness sake mm -hmm. yeah you 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 need the pope and he is the proximate rule of faith and the, and the reason why the vatican one especially but throughout the history we've seen these these very declarative statements on submission to the roman pontiff right cling to this chair follow this chair i'll be obedient to this chair why because here is salvation and the, the church knows that if i stray from the pope if i disobey if i am you know resisting the vicar of christ um i'm putting my soul in danger so she does this for my protection she tells me time and time again cling to the pope because when i cling to the pope i've got the faith the orthodox faith lowercase o um i've got the fullness of truth and uh, by clinging to the vicar of christ i am sure to be in communion with the body of christ i mean it's all beautifully intertwined and as you said I i'm not free to say well you know this bishop here is trad or this bishop here is good i'm gonna listen to him um otherwise we're just looking for bishops who just agree with us that's not how this works you need to look at the pope well and, and it shows that our faith the path the path to heaven is very difficult but it's also very sure. simple it's not it's not complicated it can't be it cannot be complicated because if it was complicated then you would have to be an extremely intelligent person to go to heaven that cannot be every person even the stupidest person ever born has the ability to go to heaven and it has to be that way it has to be simple and we have to remember that and it's a it, that's the segue i hope everyone's paying attention to my segues here to a simple soul and to a simple life and to a, a the saint of the day who did not do anything extraordinary, but simply led her life and followed the faith and really had the most simple possible path to heaven. And well, she's in heaven. So Matt, what do you have to say about St. Teresa? I know you're going to have an entire segment about her, but, but give us I a did. couple minutes. I, yeah, 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 a little, little preview. Um, yeah, I wrote up a segment on her. Um, I just kind of touched upon a little bit of her life, a little bit of her story. Um, some quotes from her, some thoughts um, of my own, and I and I narrated it and, and did my segment on it. But um, 
I believe it was Pope Pius, and I just read this and I forgot, I believe it was Pius XI who called her the greatest saint of, of modern time because um, she really, she compared herself um, to a certain extent to the giants, right? Aquinas, Augustine. She said, I can never be this. I cannot be this brilliant mind in the church. I need a different way, but I need to be holy. And she knew just what you were kind of saying there, she chose this path of holiness in very small, simple things because she knew that God was present moment, divine providence governed everything. And I can be holy now. I can, I can, as Padre Pio said, you know, I, I could surrender my, my, my future to divine providence and I could forget my past and live in the now where God is. And she perfected this really, really well. And this was her means of sanctifying herself. She did her purgatory here on earth by a lot of these means, in my opinion, because she, she was able to take the smallest inconvenience, you know, I think I said in the, in the, in my segment, like the, the, the poke of a pen or, you know, water splashing you in the face when you're doing dishes. She used all of this. She never lost sight of God being before her. She never lost sight of divine providence, literally just, uh, you know, surrounding her. And, and, and because of this, everything to her was for God. And she truly lived it that way. And I think a lot of us, you know, we, God is on our minds, but we're distracted by the world. You know, we're, we've got things to do. We're driving. We've got places to go. We've got jobs to get done. We kind of lose that. And, and she kept God in front of her forever in every moment of her day. And, and this little way of perfection, um, I think, inspired a lot of people to this new mindset of the church doesn't have to be these great doctors and, and you know, theologians, but can also be one of very simple simpleness sim simplicity um and it and inspired people there's a you know a whole generation i think got inspired of you know i can i can relate to her because i can do these things i can't write a summa i can't write confessions like augustine did but i can you know paint a room for love of god i can you know help my neighbor uh and, and use it as an act of charity cooperating with grace to 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 please god you know and this became very relatable to people and um she stood out as, 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 as a magnificent saint. And, and, it, and it's, and it's beautiful. You're totally right. And two of my favorite saints are, are, are St. Teresa and St. Pius X. And, and the, you know, the funny mm. thing is that he, he was obviously a Pope and a very learned and, and brilliant man, but also, also in a way, very simple, very, very humble, very, very, you know, yes. part, I don't know, part of the world. And, and I think not, not of the world, but I hope you know what I mean, down to earth. And, and, and I think yeah. that these two saints and in others of of the later times were kind of a preparation for us as you said they were they were to show us that our path to heaven is through daily sacrifice it is through the little way it is through giving up our lives for for god and for hmm. good and that that is is some people would say is actually going to be harder than some of the great some of the greatest saints of hmm. past times that the later saints the latter day saints will be the best. Now, I don't know if we're in the, the quote unquote latter days, but it seems likely. It seems like we're in the great apostasy. It seems that we are at at least some point in the end of the world. Now, that could be who knows? I mean, really, it could be another thousand years, mm. but but mm. but it's 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 we're in a crazy position. And if we know, as you say, and as she said, that in this time, in this difficult time, in this time of confusion, where we don't have all the answers and we have fighting and people mm people you know don't get along and we don't have unity necessarily and et cetera et cetera to to really remember saint pius x and of course saint Teresa and and how they lived and really try to model ourselves off of them humility charity and giving yourself to god's will it's it's really hard it's the hardest thing we'll ever possibly have to do ever to give up our own will for god's there's nothing harder in life to do that, but it's actually pretty simple. That's the beauty. Mm. Of it. Right, right. And she she saw that um, in, in in everything that she did, and even as a young child, you know, she was very sensitive, and I think that that kind of helped her um, a bit too. There was um, there was an event that shaped her. If I can just say really quick, um, she was young, um, and she met a friend on um, at school, I believe it was, and um, she thought that the girl and her were very close. And because of business or travel or what have you, the, the young girl and her family had to move away for some time being. They were going to come back like a year later or so, but um, they had to travel for about a year's time. And Therese writes, and this is in Story of a Soul, um, that 
from the moment that her friend left, this girl left with her family, Therese missed her. She was like, I, I missed her company. You know, they, they couldn't text in these days. Um, I missed her company. I missed her companionship. I missed her friendship. I missed talking to her. I, and she says, I thought of her every day, you know, for this entire year. Um, she was on my mind and I missed her. And the day that she came back, um, Therese was like, this was great joy to me. You know, I'm going to see my friend that I've missed so immensely over these days. And when the two met one another, the girl was like completely indifferent. She couldn't have cared less that... Uh, that Therese, you know, missed nothing. It didn't even give her the slightest bit of affection. And Therese actually commented, she was like, um, um, that was the last time I sought such fickle human uh, affection. That was the last time that I really thought that, like I need human gratification. She said, but once I love, I love for always. But I think at this point in her life, she really shifted, you know, seeking approval from others, seeking the 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 affection or the companionship of others. And she really turned herself inwards. To, and I think she loved and got, you know, fell in love with God by by this means. Um, great saint, one of my favorites. I think a lot of, you know, a lot of people have her, are very close to her. And um, I even think, and I don't know if, if, if this works theologically, but I even have thought to myself, like, I, even to Christ, I think she's got to be a little bit special. I think he, like, I mean, this is probably so wrong and not to, you know, Pope Francis quote quote once said this is probably heresy but he did say that at one point but uh not to be heretical but i think even to christ um i almost sense that like he he has a spot in his heart for her i think she's 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 she stands out if if there is such a thing well i i think that's actually that's actually uh sister faustina but um <laughs> that's a whole nother topic <laughs> but no, no I, I mean I, I agree with you and i think that's probably true and sure. i think again the, the great saints of our time that are, you know, I, I think those those two that I mentioned, St. Philomena, St. Joseph, and there's always a reason mm. for them. And that that's why, if if I'm sure Matt would recommend it too, go and read the lives of the saints. Go go and see mm. yes. what got them to heaven. And and, and St. Teresa is, is a great one because it's so recent. You know, we really, we can really right. look into her life and really learn from her and about her. And that's beautiful. And same with St. Pius X. Um, can't recommend it enough. Um, go, go, go read about them. The, the story of a soul, I believe, is her um, autobiography. Autobiography. Yeah. Um, and story right. of a family. I actually just ordered about her family, which I think would be really interesting as well. I've never read that one. Um, a, a very holy family, uh, which that, that's <laughs> another good, great example for for parents out there. To saints typically come from from yes. holy families, so yes. that's a that's yes. a great great uh, lesson for us to to work really really hard to have a holy family and have a holy household. And um, yeah, I, I'm really excited to hear your, your segment, Matt. Um, we're going to send you, send it over to that and hear more about St. Teresa because, well, again, it is her feast day and, and she earns it and she deserves it. And we hope to honor her. And we hope that that she up in heaven, as we know, one of the more active saints, as she promised us, that she looks down on this podcast and blesses us, the podcast, and all of our listeners and intercedes for us with God. And Matt, we'll throw it over to you after this quick break. Yes, sir. 30 seconds with His Excellency, Bishop Donald Sanborn. Because we were coming through a period that Pius XII had just left us. And Pius XII, uh, I always describe him, he, he was almost like a god. In a sense, his, his papacy was so magnificent and, and he, he was so full of Catholic faith and everything that he said was, was Catholic and... Uh, he, he was a, a real pope. Uh, and so the Catholic Church was still uh, sort of beaming from his papacy. And Welcome back to Monday Mornings with Matt and Kevin. We are Sidivicontists, which means we don't claim to be more Catholic than the Pope. We believe that the chair of Peter has been vacant since the death of Pope Pius XII in 1958, and that the religion being promulgated upon us by the Vatican II Church is not the Catholic religion founded by Jesus Christ. So thank you for joining me, and let's get right to it. Today is October 3rd, 2022. The Feast of the little flower, Saint Therese of Lisieux. Born Marie Francois Therese Martin on January 2nd, 1873, 
Therese was one of nine children to Louis and Zélie Martin, all five of the couple's surviving children became nuns. At the age of nine, Therese started to become quite sick. She would suffer nervous tremors and would often shake so aggressively that she would lose her ability to speak. While lying in bed one night, the young Therese experienced a miracle that would change her life. On May 13th, 1883, a statue of Our Lady that was placed in the Martin household smiled at the young saint. Overjoyed at the sight, she told the nuns of Carmel of this joyous vision, but they immediately dismissed her. The mockery she faced over this event caused self-doubt and left Therese wondering if she really did indeed see the Virgin smile at her. Still, Therese claimed all the pain she had felt was now gone. Three years later, Saint Therese experienced what she called her complete conversion. Christmas Eve, 1886. Louis Martin and his three daughters, Leonie, Celine, and Therese attended Midnight Mass. Upon arriving home, Saint Therese overheard her father say that he was getting too old to put out gifts, but the emotional demands of his weepy young daughter left him no choice. Therese, however, took this as a personal sign and that it was time to grow up. In May, of 1887, Therese approached her father and told him that it was her wish to enter Carmel. She attempted to join the monastery but was turned away due to her young age. Determined to enter, Saint Therese took her cause to the Holy Father, Pope Leo XIII. On November 20th, 1887, in general audience, the young Therese forced her way to the Supreme Pontiff and asked his permission to enter Carmel at age 15. His Holiness replied to her, Well, my child, do what the superiors decide. You will enter if it is God's will. He raised his right hand and blessed her. In awe that she was looking at sweet Christ on earth, she refused to leave the Holy Father's feet and had to be carried away by the guards. Not too long after, on April 9th, 1888, Therese received permission from the bishop and she became a Carmelite postulant. In her Story of a Soul autobiography, Saint Therese writes of this most magnificent day. I kissed the whole family and then knelt for my father's blessing. He knelt down too, and he was crying as he blessed me. It was a sight to gladden the angels, an old man offering to God his child in the springtime of life. The little flower later received news as to how her most loving father offered her to Carmel, and he said, Therese, my little queen, entered Carmel yesterday. Only God could ask for such a sacrifice. But he helped me so much that my heart is filled with joy even in the midst of tears. Saint Therese said of his father, it was his day of triumph, his last feast on earth. He had no more to offer. His whole family belonged to God. 
Life in Carmel was not easy for Therese, but she never missed an opportunity to embrace suffering for her love of souls. Mother Superior, nicknamed the Wolf, was often hard on Therese, rebuking her for everything, intolerating just about nothing from the novice. Therese, however, called Mother Superior's harshness a, quote, remarkable training, as she learned to offer everything for Jesus. Therese learned that the smallest inconvenience in life, whether it's poking your finger with a pin or getting splashed with some dishwater while cleaning, can be used to sanctify souls. And with this new, profound knowledge, Therese seemed to always deliver. She vowed to pray for priests. She had a great love for priests, especially her confessor, and she wanted nothing great in life, but wished to remain small for the bon dieu, the good God, as she often called him. Saint Therese said of her method of holiness, I will seek out a means of getting to heaven by a little way, a very short, a very straight little way that is wholly new. We live in an age of invention. Nowadays, the rich need not trouble to climb the stairs. They have lifts instead. Well, I mean to try and find a lift by which I may be raised unto God, for I am too tiny to climb the steep stairway of perfection. Thine arms then, O Jesus, are the lift which must raise me up even unto heaven. To get there, I need not grow. On the contrary, I must remain little. I must become still less. Towards the late 1890s, Therese became very ill with tuberculosis. Bedridden, she often said that she didn't have the strength to speak to our Lord in prayer, but rather she just kept him company. Her last words came on September 30th, 1897. Quote, I have reached the point of not being able to suffer anymore because all suffering is sweet to me. My God, I love you. And with these words, this great saint took her last breath. Her cause for a canonization moved rather quickly, and on May 17th, 1925, Pope Pius XI solemnly declared Therese of Lisieux to be among the saints. May we all learn to do small things with great love. May we all learn to embrace the slightest inconvenience for the salvation of souls. And may we never tire of finding this little way to heaven, which the good God has so generously opened up to us. Little flower, on this feast, pray for us. You're listening to Monday Mornings with Matt and Kevin. This is the Catholic Family Podcast.